Uh, thank you very much to Simon and Victoria uh, for inviting me to speak this year. Um, I was going to say you saved the best until last. Um, and we are competing with the final minutes of an All-Ireland uh, all Ireland competition. Twitter was telling me, oh, it's finished. Limerick won. Oh, okay. So, so we can relax now and, and uh, give the paper. So thank you very much. Um, uh, not the best until last, really, probably perhaps one of the grimmest uh, papers uh, until the end in many respects. Um, I'm going to stick quite close to text because it is almost half five on a Sunday evening and I'm conscious of the brevity um, of time of people wanting to get away to Dublin, etc. Okay, just to say as well, this, uh, what I'm speaking about today is part of a, a larger collection, an edited collection by myself on women and the Irish Revolution, um, on the whole question of violence, uh, feminism, uh, that's coming out in, tw in, in 2019 with Indiana University Press. Uh, Andy Bielenberg has a chapter on women who were killed, uh, John Borganova, Marie Coleman, Louise Ryan, Margaret Ward, Mary McAuliffe, a whole bunch of people. So you'll have plenty of choice next <laughs> year. Um, and hopefully the book will be out uh, by then. It should be. Um, so just to acknowledge that and just to acknowledge as well uh, P Patrick O'Rourke, Andy Bielenberg and John Borganova who are always looking out for sources when they're doing um, their own research. They pass on quite a bit uh, to me. Okay, so uh, the impulse to airbrush, minimize and suppress women's history is painfully evident when we examine some of the evidence into the impact of violence against women in the period up to the end of the Irish Civil War in 1923. Peter Burke states, anthropologists became aware of the problem of collective amnesia in investigating oral traditions while historians encountered it in the course of studying events such as the Holocaust or civil wars of the 20th century, including in Finland, Ireland, Russia, Spain and elsewhere. The problem is not a loss of memory at the individual level, but the disappearance from public discourse of certain events. These events are, in a sense, repressed, not necessarily because they were traumatic, though many of them were, but because it has become politically inconvenient to refer to them. And in a sense, I like that term, inconvenient truths, when we're talking about the whole question of rape and sexual violence in particular. Only this week, we see a massive debate about the role um, of the Catholic Church, etc., in, in relation to um, child sexual abuse. So I'm not looking at this as, uh, unlike our earlier speakers, I am looking at the evidence, but not as a passive observer. I'm very concerned uh, as much about these issues in the present um, as I am in the past. If we can't face up to these questions in the past, I think we've no hope um, of addressing them properly in the present. In the period 1917 to 23, the impact of violence on women has been given only some very preliminary attention in Irish studies. Uh, I remember well when Peter Hart spoke when I was in UCC, um, probably about 15 or 16 years ago, uh, uh, using the term ethnic cleansing uh, arising from the, the Balkan conflict of the 1980s. And this sparked enormous debate. But the corresponding international focus arising from the conflicts in um, Bosnia, Rwanda, etc., on rape and sexual violence uh, was not mentioned at all uh, at the time, and certainly not in the context of Ireland, where we like to think we are an exception uh, in that regard. Work in this area has been slow to emerge in Irish revolutionary studies, suggesting perhaps that Ireland is an exception when it comes to gender-based violence, both during armed conflict and in our history more generally. Louise Ryan, a colleague and friend who spoke yesterday, wrote a very, uh, what might be termed a path-breaking, but at the time largely ignored article uh, 20 years ago in Feminist Review entitled Drunken Tans. I think one of the problems is historians in particular often, just, often stick with history journals and don't look at uh, women's studies sources or feminist articles, etc., which actually are speaking to the very themes uh, they're talking about. So that cross-disciplinary focus is very important uh, in my work. It's only more recently, however, in the context of the Decade of Commemorations in Ireland that scholars like Lindsay Erner Byrne, Julia Eichenberg, Anne Matthews, Connor Heffernan and Marie Coleman have actually began to, in a sense, scrutinise this issue to varying degrees, I would say, some more uh, in-depthly than others. 
Brian Hughes, for instance, who spoke earlier today, mentions this issue in his book, but he doesn't really conduct original research. Um, it gets about half a page or something like that into this whole question. So some very basic questions, I think. And I know from the audience uh, that all your personal histories uh, are going to be intertwined in some senses with the revolution, including the women uh, in your backgrounds. So what happened to women in the violent episode of Irish history, broadly termed the Irish Revolution? What kind of violence was inflicted on Irish women as civilians primarily? And how significant was it compared to the fate of combatants and other civilians in this period? Several other questions arise about the treatment of women uh, at the current conjuncture in Centennial Ireland. First of all, did women escape the worst of the brutalities of the war between 1919 and 21 in particular, as some historians have suggested? Um, and this is often based on what we might call quantifiable evidence. Can you count the number of attacks on women? Can you count the number uh, of forced head shortings? Can you count the number of sexual assaults? No, is what I'm going to suggest in a moment. Uh, so, so quantifiable evidence and a militaristic interpretation of the presumed behaviour of male combatants in this period is often used to suggest that women escaped the worst brutalities. They weren't that impacted or they weren't as impacted as men who were on the run and who were, I suppose, uh, allegedly facing more danger. So I'm going to suggest that this assertion has not at all been adequately proven yet. It's based on conjecture and comparison often to other countries where there's better evidence preserved on this issue and different circumstances at work. Uh, moreover, more personal testimonies and stories by women, which are currently emerging, only currently emerging. Uh, since May, we've uh, opened up a whole bunch of uh, uh, military uh, pension files, which are actually documenting these kinds of issues as we speak. So in a sense, these are stories that have been buried in the past and are only now coming to light. So all of these uh, need to be considered. But before we arrive at a safe view that women uh, suffered less brutality uh, or were treated, uh, I suppose, more favourably in this period. I suppose I, as a sociologist, I would add a further question to all of that. and I'd say, well, how is sexual violence being defined in revolutionary studies? Only this week we had a massive debate about consent and what consent means uh, between our good friends in the NUI, Senator Ronan Mullen um, and, and the Rape Crisis Centre. And Nolan Blackwell had a superb piece in the Irish Times yesterday outlining very clearly uh, what consent is and what rape is. So how has this been defined in Irish studies and in Irish history? These are critical questions for the historians and for the scholars in Irish studies today if we are to grapple properly with this question. And as, as I saw um, in one of the earlier papers, if we're uh, not to ignore uh, half of the population that are impacted by the kinds of issues we're looking at in this festival all weekend. Um, so I would say there's little conceptual clarification uh, in Irish historical studies uh, on what uh, sexual violence means and in particular there's little uh, uh, I suppose attention to the the analysis that has been done of the relationship between sex and war in extensive publications internationally we quite simply are too focused on our own little patch and not looking outside of Ireland at the kinds of studies that have been done on the Spanish Civil War the Greek Civil War uh, etc and I'm going to draw on a few uh, examples of that to try and look back into Ireland uh, as to what was happening to women in this period um, so I'm thinking again, just to mention the work of uh, Catherine Stefatis, uh, for instance, on the political persecution and gender violence in the Greek Civil War. And again, there's quite a bit now coming through in Spain. So there's a lot of work we can draw on uh, to look at the Irish case. So in a nutshell, I suppose, what I want to argue for this evening uh, is for a deeper and expanded scholarship on things like the policing of women's bodies, on sexual violence and the harassment of women in the Irish Revolution, including better use of sources from outside of Ireland uh, to look at this question. In particular, I will critique the, the tendency to suggest that forms, against, forms of violence against women were more lenient uh, than what was called uh, lethal violence, um, such as, for instance, hair shorning uh, or head shaving, which was widely inflicted on Irish women in this period and indeed in the majority of European civil wars or world wars uh, of a more mass scale. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about hair for a minute. So hair is a very significant, um, why it's such a significant issue that I do this properly. 
So, okay, so here, have, how many of you have seen The Wind That Shakes the Barley? Most of you have seen it, yeah, okay. So, so okay, so this is obviously a scene um, from the, uh, the, the Wind That Shakes the Barley. So, um, so uh, ample evidence exists to, to suggest that women were, in various ways, labelled, uh, humiliated, disciplined and stigmatised uh, throughout this period, but primarily through what we might call the symbo symbo more symbolic realm of their bodies and their sexuality uh, in particular. As I said, here we see an image from Ken, Ken Loach's uh, film, and uh, I'm just going to quote from Connor Heffernan, who remarks, Troops storm into the house and forcibly evicting those inside. Screams of terror emanate from the house, growing louder and louder with each moment. Soon the house will be set on fire. In the melee that ensues, troops single out a woman known for collaborating with the enemy. Held down at gunpoint, her head is shaved. In the distance, fighters from the other side look on as she wails. Now, while this is fictional, in a sense, in the, in the, in the movie, um, it, it, it touches on, really, uh, a seldom discussed occurrence at the time, namely acts of intimidation and degradation targeted specifically at Irish women. Atrocities were committed, as we heard earlier, Protestant Catholics on both sides, um, and subsequent generations have yet to fully examine them. Uh, but intimidation of women and head shaving are just one example of a past that historians have yet to discuss adequately. Um, moreover, in talking about sectarianism, sectarianism earlier, often um, when we look at gender and women, many of these um, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, crimes, for want of a better word, they cut across all the different divides. So there's something to be looked at here in terms of the relationship between gender uh, and religion uh, and nationhood. The social and political role of the act of forcibly shearing women's hair, I would suggest, lacks historical analysis in Irish studies. And in fact, it's a deep-rooted practice over time and place. Um, Hair shearing is often treated as kind of a lenient thing. You were, you know, you were dragged out, you had your hair cut. But in fact, it can be a serious uh, form of assault. And it was rife in Ireland in this period. It crops up everywhere. It crops up in the newspapers. It crops up in the witness statements. It's cropping up, sorry, pun, bad use the word, cropping up um, more and more uh, in the kinds of local studies that are being done. Um, and I'll give you a few, I'll, I'll go through a few examples in a moment. So hair is a kind of a physiological thing, okay? We all have a relationship with, with hair to various degrees. Um, but it's also a social one, I would say. Hair is an object of intense elaboration and preoccupation in all societies. In many cultures, um, for example, hair grooming rituals have, you know, religious uh, meanings. And also many social taboos are centered on hair. So what I'm supposed interested in is that whole practice of hair as a means of social control. Um, and dehumanization. Um, the term hair taking, for instance, by the state uh, is something we see occurring uh, in many conflicts. Some p cultures believe that a link remains between the individual and severed hair, allowing the person who gained possession of the locks to exert power. So it has a huge symbolic relevance in, relevance, sorry, in terms of power, um, in terms of um, social import. In Western cultures, hair serves as, a, as an important symbol of sexuality. Um, hair often serves as a symbol of women's virgin state. Again, just to give you an example, in keeping with this, the Furos, the local codes of law and custom on the Iberian Peninsula, uh, when legislating for damage to different parts of the body, uh, uh, penalties for seizing a woman by the hair um, are listed. These codes suggest that the violation of hair was seen as a violation of the woman's honour. So in terms of Ireland, it's clear uh, that enforced cutting of hair in the dehumanisation and sanctioning of women occurred on both sides of the conflict in Ireland, Crown Forces and IRA. So, in terms of all the questions we were asking earlier, to add another uh, dimension or layer, how can we interpret this practice in what was otherwise a deeply divided uh, society? Why did this form of assault on women transgress the political divide and indeed other state divides across Europe? Is it a form of highly sexualized violence or a 
or sexual assault, as psychoanalytic, anthropologists, feminist scholars, etc., have shown. And if so, why are historians crudely comparing it to murders and kidnaps of rebellious men rather than studying the specificity of this form of violence as a gendered and a sexual practice in Irish history? Hair cutting and shaving of women uh, on a systematic scale, of course, um, is widely prevalent. I, I already mentioned, um, I'm just going to show you a few images. Um, I mean, if you just go on the internet, you'll see. Um, oh, just to say, sorry, I, I, I've only been able to find one sort of live example of an Irish woman who was shorn. And this one, if you go on and have it at the bottom there, happy to give it to you after, it's the, the Irish Film Archive website. Um, it doesn't really tell us very much. She's just standing there. She's kind of almost encapsulates that silencing of women because she, you know, obviously there's, there's no sound on it. But there is one, that's the only image I have really come across in terms of real time, in terms of a film reel. Um, so, sorry, just to move on. Yeah, so, um, so again, I mentioned um, the Greek and the Spanish civil wars. Again, here, you know, there's lots of images. Here you see women who had their heads shaved in Toledo for being relatives who were Republican um, in 1936. And again, we're keeping the timing. You know, if you think of the timing of the Irish Revolution, we're now into the 1930s, and then we get into the Second World War, where these images are just everywhere. Um, at the end of World War II, over 20,000 uh, French women predominantly, but not exclusively, um, accused of collaboration with Germany, endured a particularly uh, humiliating act of revenge. Their heads were shaved in public. Um, this episode in French history uh, continues to provoke shame and unease, perhaps in a way that it hasn't done uh, in the Irish context for reasons that I outlined earlier. In 1944 to 45, for instance, photo photographers like Robert Kappa documented the terrible brutality to women accused of sexual collaborations with the Germans. Now, there's a whole other debate about this. I won't go into it too much today. Uh, Anthony Beaver, for instance, suggests that women were singled out as a way of kind of taking attention away from some of the things that some of the men didn't do in the communities and so forth, that it was kind of used for other um, you know, reasons. Uh, but I suppose what's really key and what's different about uh, these kinds of very public, you can see, they're very public. There's an element of carnival. The women are paraded through the streets. There is actually some video footage as well of these. Um, in contrast to the Irish case, it tended to be you know, late at night or in the middle of the night and, and done without that kind of element of carnival, uh, though not exclusively, as we'll see in a moment. Um, the French were not alone in shaving the heads of women who allegedly slept with the enemy. Uh, similarly, uh, proprietary national interests regarding the sexuality of German women were recorded, for instance, by Berthold Brecht in his poem entitled Ballad of Mary Sanders, The Jew's Whore, uh, 1934 to 36. And I'll just read you a little bit from this. Uh, Brecht wrote that Mary Sanders, a woman from Nuremberg, was driven through the town in her slip, round her neck a sign, her hair all shaven. Her crime was to have slept with a Jew who, ironically, had he been Hasidic, might have insisted upon shaving her head after marriage. So you see that symbolic um, difference. Again, Christine Stiles' work is very pivotal here. Um, and she writes, the community gathered in French towns and villages to shear her head with animal clippers and then smear the sign of swastika in soot on her bald forehead. The citizens judged her a horizontal collaborator for having sex with German soldiers during World War II. Denigrated and denounced as a whore, she was even stripped naked, sometimes before being paraded through town, a token of emblematic territories, defamations and controls of war. So, to turn back to Ireland, as we know, arson, kidnapping and fake executions were all employed in Ireland along hijackings and murder. Men were the main targets of ex executions and kidnappings, and we heard from Andy's paper earlier, the, the small number of women who were actually killed. However, women undoubtedly became the targets for more for head shavings, uh, beatings and rape, with head shaving uh, being the most common uh, punishment in the context of Ireland by far. Newspaper reports suggest that in most instances, as I said, these took place at night, as was the case for a Miss Julia Goonan, who was taken at midnight by her attackers. And I suppose this is what I want to get across. It's the, 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 head, the shearing of hair isn't just a sort of an isolated inc incident. It's like a continuum. So often it can involve uh, physical 
uh, punishment, uh, but in the, uh, the dragging of hair, which must be an enormously uh, painful thing. But in this case, this woman was actually hung up by her hair uh, before she was shaved. So, so this kind of idea of a lenient form of punishment, I think, is something that absolutely has to be knocked in its head. Uh, victim accounts reveal how hair was not only sheared, uh, as I said, it was used um, in a variety of ways with other kinds of verbal and physical assault and intimidation, but it was, sorry, wasp, but it was always, always humiliating. Um, reports from the Irish Times at the time detail numerous occasions when Irish rebels were the ones meeting out this punishment to women considered too close to the enemy. Again, Eileen Barker is another example, having had her head shaved at gunpoint by members of the IRA for allowing British troops to stay in her hotel. So again, the different justifications are to varying degrees, uh, not just about, uh, as I said, having sex with collaborators, but also things like you know, supporting troops through letting them stay in your hotel, etc. So head shaving, as we said earlier, was a deliberate violation of victims' femininity. While the cutting itself was painful, the aftermath could be worse, as the shaved woman became a symbol of betrayal and a warning to others. Um, okay. Now, I just want to give a few examples from the witness statements, just because I suppose it's often the story. So as I said, here's a, a headline from the picture is not... Uh, from the same period, but again a headline, um, 21st of July 1920, the Irish Times, outrage in Cork, girls' hair cut on the street. So we see examples. Again, I've just picked out a few more. So some, as I say, if you go through the witness statements, for instance, or the pension files even, you see some of them are like, oh, you know, so-and-so had her head shaved and it's kind of like, you know, they had their dinner or whatever, whereas others are, are much more graphic. So here's an example of one. This is, I tried to pick out a few Cork ones in, in light of our location. So this is Leo Buckley. Staff Officer Intelligence Cork Number 1 Brigade. Our military historians will know exactly what that is. I haven't a clue. Um, so um, he says, um, so basically you can see the story. So um, he said, I remember at the time young girls from Cork going out to Ballincollig to meet the British soldiers. Um, the term, incidentally, I talked about harassment earlier. I don't have much material on this today. But uh, uh, the, the term soldiers totty was used for women who were seen to be kind of close you know, kind of hanging out uh, with the soldiers, etc. Um, in some cases, it's very clear that this attention was unwanted by the women, uh, but they still got the label um, uh, soldiers um, totty. Anyway, uh, he says, Leo Buckley says, we curbed this by bobbing the hair of persistent offenders. Short hair was completely out of fashion at the, at the period, and the appearance of a girl with bobbed hair, and I think this is the crucial thing, clearly denoted her way of life. So you can see this kind of labelling and, and stigmatisation at work. Now I don't know, somebody else might know where these women were doing or were they just looking to hang out soldiers? Someone else suggested to me they might actually have been prostitutes but I don't actually uh, know. Um, so that might be something somebody in the audience might. Here's a different one and I really like this. It's very evocative uh, not because the woman's head was um, sheared but it's kind of it just captures so much and we you know we talked about earlier about how the carnival aspect you know in, in France etc was very important and that you know it's presumed the majority of head shavings took place kind of the women were dragged into a field and um, but here's a quite a semi-public one I suppose and again it's in Galway and uh, Michael Higgins and he says so you get the scene here this woman um, wrote a, she was basically too close to an, an RIC man, I think, if I can remember correctly, and um, uh, she wrote him a letter. So I'll just read it out. Brigadier Fogarty gave them a lecture on the gravity of the offence and said she was being treated leniently in having her hair cut off. There was a scene. The girl was crying and her people were sprinkling holy water on her and on us. She was a very beautiful girl before her hair was sheared and I pitied her, although I knew I should not in the circumstances. And he says, I saw her in tomb one day shortly afterwards. She stared at me from the door of the RIC barracks, and I got out of her view as quickly as I could. So again, it's just kind of evocative, isn't it, with the throwing of, of the holy water, etc. And you often think about the, the cultural memory that went on over the generations. Those people, I bet, know each other and so are still sort of living, or families are living around. And as to why, I suppose, our whole narrative really became what it was without these kinds of issues um, is, is, is 
fascinating, uh, for want of a better word. Okay, so there's lots more examples I go through, but I don't have. I could go through, but I don't have time. I suppose just to sum up before I get on to the question of um, rape and sexual assault, which is a bit more difficult. I suppose, you know, historians of the revolution have tended to either completely omit discussion of this practice or give it kind of a throwaway remark. And this is in stark contrast uh, to the histories of obviously much larger wars conducted in Belgium, France, Germany, etc. But other countries where perhaps you know, we should be looking to for more comparative analysis like Spain, Greece, Italy, um, etc. Um, I think is is a way forward. And again, I could criticise a lot of my colleagues. They know I will criticise them. Bill Kassan, Peter Hart, David Fitzpatrick, all these people. They just kind of, you know, I spoke at David Fitzpatrick's retirement um, event uh, and he quite acknowledged that he had omitted to look at the question of, of gender and women in that collection uh, terror in Ireland. Um, now, 87% of... Uh, prof um, History professors in Ireland are men, of course, so we, that might have something uh, to do with it. Uh, but we're working on that one. Okay. I better stop now before I get into trouble with that. Okay. I want to move on. Am I okay for time? Yes, yeah. you To the, the second bit. Okay. Which is more tricky. And I, I don't often issue what we might call a, a, a trigger warning in contemporary societies. But, you know, really, um, these are very, these kind of questions of rape um, and sexual violence can be very traumatizing. Obviously, I, I'm careful at uh, the stories. But, you know, if, 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 um, just to warn people um, ahead um, of that. Um, so, so we know there was head shaving. Um, there are many examples. I've just given you a couple, and I've tried to throw, shed some light as to why this happened and where it occurred, etc. But the more difficult question of rape and sexual assault is really probably the more taboo subject um, of the revolution. And so I would suggest that there's an Irish exceptionalism interpretation uh, when it comes uh, to women's lives in general. Um, and part of that relates to this topic. Uh, it has been stated um, that a paucity of statistical or documentary evidence suggests that there was very little rape in the 1917 to 23 period when you compare Ireland to, let's say, large-scale wars in other parts of Europe, where we know, you know, we know the, the Russians, the, you know, etc., that there was, um, and from more contemporary uh, conflicts as well, where we see this kind of use of the term rape almost as a as a weapon of war. Um, now we're not talking about that in Ireland. There's nowhere in the records you will find that that that, that either side decided that that would be part of their military strategy, let's say. But that's not to suggest that this, this didn't occur. So I want to challenge this view for a number of reasons. So first of all, I would say that rape is always underreported and in fact, in some circumstances, never reported, probably most, even today, never mind during the Irish Revolution. It is by definition a hidden crime or atrocity. Um, the shame of being a fallen woman or a single mother, for instance, or a woman of dubious morality, as we saw, um, in talking about the women who were bobbed, going to ban and colic, this took precedence over the kind of contemporary terms we use today, like seeking justice or accountability for a crime. And of course, we know that rape only became considered a crime uh, in only very recent decades. More, moreover, I think the wrong points of, being co of comparison are being used. It's pointless to compare instances of rape in mass world wars with the conflict in Ireland. And that's quite a popular thing to do, to argue that it didn't really happen you know, in the Irish context. So context is very important. Uh, here I agree with Joanna Burke, whose magisterial text on the history of rape uh, suggests that rape and sexual abuse are common if we do not, even if we do not actually know how many women and men are raped every year. Sexual assault eludes statistical no notation. It is, simply, uh, it is not simply that the statistics are collected in a consistent or reliable manner. It is that they cannot exist. So, unlike our previous paper, we're not going to get an insight into these questions by trying to gather statistic or count up. We, might, we can count the number of dead, I guess, because you know, when you're dead, you're dead. Um, but um, sexual assault or rape or the kinds of traumas I'm talking about, they kind of, in a sense, defy uh, numerical analysis. That's not to suggest we shouldn't look or, or look at the numbers of cases. But there is a hidden aspect to what I'm talking about here. Again, the term rapist, for instance, only came into common usage in 1883. Um, 
The largest proportion of adult rapes we know over time are male on female attacks, but again, not exclusively. So again, we have no insight into the other um, aspects of this. As Burke, Joanna Burke, and feminist writers since the 50s have shown, uh, perpetrators consistently get away with rape in a society and culture that protects perpetrators and puts an inordinate burden of proof on victims. And this period of Irish history in society more generally was no different uh, in that sense. In fact, it was worse. There is no crime more difficult to prove than rape and no injured party more distrusted than the rape victim. Um, so I'm going to talk in a minute about two cases, um, just two cases of rape and sexual assault. And in both cases, the kind of semi quasi inquiries into them were, of course, done in secrecy. And it kind of, I suppose, you know, that's the point I'm trying to make, that it's in secrecy, you know, that these issues are dealt with. There's a huge literature on, 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 um, on, on this, you know, in general, but not really uh, in relation to what I'm looking at here. And, of course, we do hear of things in relation to, you know, the, in the troubles in Northern Ireland as well, about how these kinds of issues were dealt with in a quiet way or dealt with within the ranks, so to speak. So this is no different to what I'm talking about here. Um, Gemma Clark's contention that Louise Ryan only referred to a handful of cases in her very article on very early article on this topic therefore appears to be premature when we take all this into account. Calling out a rape within a victim's family, never mind in public, is a rare occurrence. But this cannot be confidently conflated with rape being rare in revolutionary Ireland. We don't know that. We simply don't know uh, yet. Moreover, Additional victim narratives in Irish history are now continuing to come to light and clearly now do exist in rela relation to rape during the Irish Revolution, which requires much further investigation. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples. So again, a bit like the Hirsch warning a minute ago when I said there's these kind of references interspersed or peppered into the, the witness statements in particular where you, you, know, you see, oh, you know, so there's kind of almost hearsay or reports of. So here we have um, Seamus Fitzgerald, uh, Carrig Begg, Summerhill, Cork, who was a TD in the first um, Dáil Éireann, another Cork person. And he just said, uh, I, had, I have been asked if I had collected any evidence of rape by Crown forces. I regret to say that I had two such cases. One, an already middle-aged pregnant woman was raped in Blackpool by blackened hands. And in the same locality, another middle-aged woman successfully resisted a similar uh, attempt. And I suppose that's what I would like to say, I suppose, that there's a continuum of violence here around the kind of physical assault, the head churning. You know, we don't know in attacks, in the microdynamics of violence, what happens and what the outcomes actually are. I mean, the main thing is that you have, uh, uh, I suppose, um, a context of gender-based violence at work here uh, in the revolution. Now, here I come to, and, and, and again, I think sources, we talked about sources in the earlier sessions. This is absolutely critical. And I draw on my colleague and friend, Lindsay Erner Byrne, who's one of the other important UCD historians, I like to call her. Um, she, um, she wrote a paper, she published a paper um, about the, the rape of Mary M. And again, Lindsay is one of the things we grapple with in this area is whether or not to name the women, even where the records are available. Um, because families, you know, there is a, a taboo, if you like. Um, so that's one of the questions we have around the ethical dimensions, you know, of, of naming victims. And we might come back to that in the questions. Um, so the rape of Mary um, was recounted by Lindsay Erner Byrne in a brilliant article. And I think it shatters the myths many of the myths about uh, rape in Irish revolutionary history. And I'm just going to read out a part of it. So, so just to give you the context, well, I'll read it out first and then I'll give you the context. Okay. So Mary M. Uh, was, is from um, the Midlands, shall we say. Um, During the political trouble, when looting and robbing and raiding were carried on to such an extent in our country district, my trouble began. In January 1923, a party of men armed to the teeth and calling themselves Republicans forced their entrance into our house, wherein three people resided. Um, and they're very vulnerable, actually, when you read through it. So the three people residing were my aunt, who is totally blind and is over 70 years, my uncle, 70, and I, their niece, an orphan. So clearly she was the carer for the, the aunt and uncle. Um, they weren't, if you like, a, you know, as I say, they seemed to be quite a vulnerable um, group in the house. Uh, Miriam was actually in her 40s, so she wasn't a, a young woman. 
so to speak, depending on... Um, uh, I have to be careful. <laughs> so, um, okay. So she said, the object of their visit was money or lives. When I strove to save my aunt from being dragged from her bed and they were furious when they did not get money, one brute satisfied his duty passion on me. And again, if you didn't proceed with this statement, you might think, what does that mean? You know, like it's, sometimes it's, you see statements and you're almost kind of reading between the lines, but then you know you don't have the evidence, so you have to be careful. But in this case, there is evidence because she became pregnant. Um, she said, I was then in a dangerous state of health and through his conduct, I became pregnant. Oh God, could any pen describe what I have gone through? Now, what I think is interesting here is this source you won't find a source like this in a military archive. You won't find it in the crime statistics. It was found in, uh, she wrote this letter upon giving up her son to an orphanage. So it was found in church records as a letter. Um, the, as I say, the record of this rape won't be found in any official record. It was buried in institutional records around unwanted and stigmatized children, uh, which is where I believe a great deal of the evidence of sexual violence uh, lies in Ireland. And we'll talk a bit later about the trauma and the number of nervous breakdowns, etc., among some of these victims that I'm looking at. The record is in the institutions that some of them ended up in. I don't mean mother and baby homes, I mean asylums as well due to nervous breakdowns. Um, I think it's a testament to Lindsay, uh, her acute eye as a historian, for her use of the correct kind of source to ask different questions to the rape wasn't all that common in Ireland point of view and using our received, shall we say, methods in military history, which are wonderful, um, but which maybe are not quite giving us the answers we need to know uh, about the treatment of women in the revolution. Um, okay, so I'm just going to skip on a bit. Again, so the contention that women suffered less brutality, you can see I do not agree with this. Um, I think it must be considered with caution and I think it's premature given the need for further research of the kind that Lindsay has uncovered and done, and she published this in a, in a paper. Um, I think we have to be careful as well. We talk a lot about the context of the troubles in Northern Ireland, if we're commemorating, etc. Gosh, what have you argued that the violence wasn't so bad after all by the IRA, etc. That can inform contemporary debates. I think we also have to be careful with those arguments as well, that the violence was lenient. We, can't, we shouldn't serve to undermine those few cases we do know about where it is very difficult for women to step forward or to put pen to paper and explain um, to that institution as to why. In fact, if you read the paper, she also paid throughout her life for the upkeep um, of that child uh, in the orphanage. So it's a very, very sad story. Um, okay, so much of this crime is by definition hidden and indeed I would go further. It's hidden in these kinds of archives and these sources, but in fact it was covered up as well. Um, and of course it was underreported. Now I'm going to just refer briefly the case of Kate Marr, which I don't know if any of you are familiar. This is again, um, sorry, there's one other one, Nora Healy in Cork in the Rahali papers. Again, if you're interested in this, um, she, again, this is the kind of complexity of this. So she was a pregnant woman in her house in Cork, two British soldiers knock on the door, drunk, and one of them took her out the back and assaulted her and raped her. Her husband had actually been in the First World War. Like this is the kind of, do you know what I mean? That the, the, the sense of target or there is, isn't always that this is a kind of a, a militaristic strategy where it's one side opposing the other. Um, and she went to report her crime to the barracks the next day. But the statement from the officer, she saw, she saw the perpetrator when she was there. She met him. She saw him in the distance. And, and the officer in charge said to her, never mind, don't say anything now. Okay? So... Um, Kate Marr is another example. Um, oh, this is a very well-known case of rape and murder, and I'll talk about that at the end, where really she was um, a woman who was out in the pub um, in Dundrum, County Tipperary. She was drinking with the British soldiers. Cutting a very long story short, uh, she was murdered. She was found dead the next day. But the key thing was in the file, marked secret, I've read the whole file, marked secret um, with extensive um, vaginal wounds. So, the, again, there was never got to the bottom of that. Um, whether it was a group of soldiers or not, we don't know. Um, so you can read the file. It's all, all these sources are available. Okay. Um, 
And the final one. Okay, so... Okay, the final one I want to refer to is a very recent one. And again, this is why it's so important that we don't presume that, if you like, the punishment was less lenient. So this is one that came out in that new batch of files in May. And funny, and I gave this paper at the Fitzpatrick Colloquium. Somebody came up to me and said, quietly, I can't say it is, there are other instances, but they're, they're closed. And I said, well, why are they closed? This is part of the truth of the revolution. And it was cases where there was children involved. Okay? Now, we might debate that at the, at the end as well. So this woman, Margaret D., Margaret Doherty, Maggie Doherty, as she was known, just found as, as well, again, and I'll just quickly, it's hard to read there, but effectively, the um, file relates to Catherine Doherty. So this is uh, Margaret's mother. Um, it's a pension application. Um, coming, so I suppose a lot of these women, I'm moving on now in the final part, to looking at women who were very active, who seemed, were sort of almost in, they were active Republicans in common on, they were engaging in all the activities, um, you know, really in a very kind of, um, they had a lot of agency. And Margaret is one example of that. So, so Margaret died on the 28th of December 1928 in what the, the file calls the mental hospital, we wouldn't use that term today, um, in Casa Bar, and was deemed, to have been uh, it was deemed to have been attributable to her service in common a man. It was stated that on a night in May, June 1923, Margaret Doherty was taken from her family home by three masked National Army members and outraged by them. So again, there's a long discourse. I won't take you through it. The material is way too hard to go through anyway. But she was um, effectively raped by three men. It was a gang rape. Um, and it is quite corroborated. I've looked at the medical evidence, etc. But she had, she was never the same after. I mean, she had a nervous uh, breakdown, and it's quite, it's quite clear in in the file. So that's a very sad one. So, moving on. So just to get to the final part, I've no idea how long this is, but anyway, um, I'm near the end. You'd be pleased to know. Um, John Horan and Alan Kramer observed in 2001 uh, that wartime rape was a three-way relationship between the perpetrator, victim, and the victim's male com compatriots. The demonous opposition in military conflict is utterly subverted by the common or shared violent treatment of women on both sides that occurs. And here I suppose I'm trying to get at the reasons why we see this occurring, you know, not as a kind of an example of what one side was perpetrating. And indeed, I mean, again, we could break down the religion. Um, it's argued that, that, that the Catholic women were more uh, prone to head cheering because they were the ones, if you like, more likely to be in collaboration with the enemy, so to speak. Now, we don't know. Maybe there were examples um, on the other side of Protestant women um, engaging with the IRA or whatever, but it's doubtful. Um, so, so that there is, I suppose... Um, there is a religious aspect to this, not to negate it, but that, I suppose, in terms of gender, we see this occurring uh, on both sides. Um, the file of Margaret, of Maggie Doherty, shows in detail uh, that she ultimately ended up in a state of debilitating and acute mental dis distress, and she had no prior health condition at all. Joanna Burke and others reiterate that such gang rapes in militarised contexts can be particularly violent because the leader of the gang normally has to continually prove he is more powerful than the others, often ending in death of the victim as a result. And perhaps that is reminiscent of what happened to Kate Marr, uh, the woman in Dundrum earlier on. So, to move on just before I conclude, nearly there, I just want to mention one final issue. And there's, there's tons of stuff here. I mean, I'm really... You know, I sort of when I say, I, I say it's obvious, but then I wonder why this hasn't really been looked at properly. There's lots of examples then of what we might call, I suppose, the climate of violence. And that's where you see violence, but it's not really clear what happened or what the outcome was, as I mentioned earlier. So here we're talking about the raids where women were injured or roughly um, treated, and where it's not clear if a sexual assault is occurred. One thing you'll find is that... that um, you know, the women were often taken out at night, they're in their nightdress. You know, you see evidence of that as well, and that the, the men pull the nightdress, all these kinds of things. But we just don't know, I mean, um, what happened in many of these cases. But here, I suppose, you just see again, just the sheer um, terror. Um, I'll just read out a little bit of it. Um, actually, I'll 
Yeah, so you see the block capsule. She said, you know, this is a mother. We were having breakfast. I see they, the way the soldiers came in and they seized their tea and they threw the eggs and, and all that kind of stuff. She says, the officer then told me to go upstairs and get my clothes on as I was under arrest. I did this and was followed by two soldiers. Uh, and for that reason, I came downstairs again without changing my clothes. So what I'm talking about here is, I suppose, that, and again, this is quite important to think about in terms of trauma and the trauma that carried on, that atmosphere of threat. So we might say, well, yes, rape perhaps was a rare occurrence, but the threat or the fear um, of assault, I suppose, um, was there and how that was uh, carried through. And even with the head cheering, again, I don't think you could look at these questions as separate because that threat or fear is always there. Okay. Here again, it's quite a long uh, witness statement. I'm happy to, to, to leave it up afterwards. But you see, very, very physical. There's no sexual assault here. There's no head shearing. But it's a very uh, rough uh, physical attack on these women uh, in Bandon. Okay. So, to conclude, if one can conclude on such a topic. Um, the rights and wrongs of our history is a term I like to use. When I see the word our history, uh, my alarm bells always go off um, because it's a term much abused, I think. Um, in a striking metaphor by Ardner in 1975, uh, women have been described as what we call a muted group in history in many times and places, only able to express their ideas through the dominant language of males. Is this still the case? Are women still a muted group in Irish history, particularly when we look at the elision and suppression of gender-based violence in the period in question? Diffi difficult questions demand difficult histories, and the decade of commemorations in the plural should present an opportunity for a new debate about a fundamental reimagination of what Irish history is and could be. Part of this relates to the legacy of transgressive violence as it applies to women's lives in the period 1917 to 23, and indeed the harsh reality and continuity of such crimes in contemporary societies. In order to understand the scale and level of sexual crime in the present, we must first start by denying its scale and existence in our past, including informative moments of nationhood and revolution. When we examine the question of sexual violence in women's lives today, the revolution is not just a distant memory of the past, the analysis uh, required has barely begun. I just want to say two final quick things about after the revolution, because again, we can get stuck on, I suppose, analysing the micro issues of the period, but actually we need, it's, it's, it's what happens after. As I said earlier, when you're dead, you're dead, but it's the people who are, who are left after really are the ones we really need um, to be looking at here. Okay, so my concluding thoughts, and they really are my concluding thoughts. Okay. Um, so the, the, when we turn to the period after the state, okay, in the 1920s, again, I would suggest, I'm sure others would disagree, but I would suggest it's that period really devastated women in so many ways, uh, curbing our rights in particular. And we know that. I've written a lot on the history um, of women's rights in the 20s, the 30s, 40s, etc. Revisionist scholars would argue that women were simply used by nationalist movements and then repressed from the 1920s onwards. They were the Censorship of Publications Act, etc. I could go on. Now, I would say women were certainly useful, uh, but they were useful as very active and brave members of Common Amman, etc. And the new witness statements, I'd urge you to read them. I mean, what these women were doing, it, whether it was right or wrong is a whole other issue, but what they were doing was incredibly brave, incredibly j dangerous and very, very traumatic, as we see here. Um, so what is apparent is that when the new state was subsequently established, something went terribly wrong, and I'll finish on this note. So two things I would say uh, dominated the post-independence period, and I want, I want, uh, this is why I want to finish on saying that there's a lot of talk of the Civil War is going to be the most difficult commemoration, etc., it depends on how you define the civil war because one of our most difficult issues to grapple with in contemporary societies is exactly what I'm talking about here, but also our history of mass uh, incarceration and institutionalization that we've been dealing with in several uh, inquiries, etc., in recent years. Um, looking at the new pensions collection, only open since May, as I said, some of the files are still closed. I think now that there is an unexplored link between violence, women, 
institutionalization and mental health and the revolution that has to be looked at. Asylums and nervous breakdowns feature in numerous sources I've looked at, not just of women, by the way. Um, you see references to men having nervous breakdowns, often being nursed through these things by the women who were hiding them you know, in their houses, etc., in this period. Um, I'll just finish with three very brief examples. Um, the files of Molly O'Shea in, in Kerry, who became intertwined. Her brother was part of the Bally CD massacre that's got all this attention. Um, again, a very evocative file. Clearly a beautiful woman, very active, etc. Just ended up in a, a, a state of, I suppose, mental disarray, for want of a better word. Even the terminology is hard to find. I referred to Margaret Doherty earlier uh, and what happened to Margaret. And also, I'll finish with this one, Adelia Begley from Ennis, uh, which I acknowledge Niall Murray for this in the examiner. He picked up on this one. Uh, she suffered a nervous breakdown after attending men who were wounded while making explosives in 1919 um, and this later saw in the care and this is my institutionalization bit in the care of the sisters of charity and I'm not going to get into that but we all know about the some of the recent history of the sisters of charity and um, which is a whole other issue um, but she ended up there and I think it's very sad and the sister I can't remember the yes sister Pascaline wonderful name um, wrote you know you see it in the relatives or in this case the nun writing um, for the pension in support of someone who's not able to do it themselves, I suppose, is what you see. So Sister Pascaline writes, Miss Begley had no estate. In fact, she was destitute. She fought bravely for her country, but when she became helpless, no one wanted her, not even her relations. So, did the Ireland of the 1920s lock away an institutionalise... Sorry. Did the Ireland of the 1920s lock away and institutionalise the trauma of the revolution suffered by women. Is this where the ultimate sources on the hidden history of women in the revolution lie? Was this, was this lethal for women who are victims of assault in the revolution or just lenient punishment meted out? A human rights scandal of incarceration that has blighted our centennial history continues to mar our contemporary polity, the roots of which must quite clearly lie in some part at least in the Irish Revolution. The mother and baby homes, etc., they all come from the 1920s. They come, don't come from the 50s, the 60s, the 80s, etc. Um, so, I suppose this analysis provides a very different kind of narrative to the forensic analysis of sectarianism, ethnicity, community conflict, etc., that has dominated the rather neat masculinist historiography, historiography that has prevailed to date. Thank you very much for listening.